Thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it, and it's great to see so many of our, our colleagues in the same room. Let me start by reading an email, if I may. This email came in the last month or so from one of our alums, uh, a major donor to a new project that we're, we're setting up. This is a quite senior person, uh, finance industry, managing director, quite senior person, and, and I'm reading directly from the email. And this is the first line of the email we had updated this, this person about some of the market response to the program that his wonderful gift made possible. And he writes in the email, this brings tears to my eyes. Thank you all so much for believing. You will all do more significant things in your careers because you educate and touch so many people. For me, I won't ever do anything more significant and lasting than this. This is forever. Thank you. So, we are stewards of institutions that play enormously important roles in society. I don't need to tell you that, but we sometimes need to remind even ourselves about what's going on in our institutions and how we're interacting with people and the sorts of things that, look, when we are at our best, we transform. When we are at our best, we transform. And I probably give exactly the same speech that you do when new students arrive. One of the things that I talk about is, look, we got to make sure we deliver capabilities in finance, marketing, and strategy, et cetera, right? Those, those fundamentals are fundamentals because you, you need to have them. But that, that by itself is not enough. So what are the transformations that happen in our programs? What is the, the meta product, if you will, the total product? And there are a set of transformations. I want to talk about one of the ones that I talk about literally in, in the first 10 minutes of when I'm onboarding new students. And you can see the title there, from purpose consumers to purpose creators. Uh, I'll, I'll mention one other because there are a number of these and I'm sure there are a number that you talk about or at least think about when, when you're thinking about your program and its design, how it goes beyond the, the very important functional areas that we all deliver. So one of those transformations, if I'm, I'm just kind of pretending that, that we've got a new class in front of me and I'll say, here's, here's one of these transformations. Here's one. Uh, and we'll talk about this at the end of your program. But this transformation, you think about a starting company, starting your own company. For example, you could apply this transformation in a lot of different areas. But the transformation in one's thinking from, they do that. Those people out there start companies. To, I do that. I get this. I may not choose to start a company right out of school, but I get it. That's an identity change. Right? That is psychological permission to use all the optionality that our programs are providing people. What's that worth? That's worth, in my, I teach finance. I'll put it in finance terms. I, I think that's worth more than a lot of what I teach. So, so those, those breakthrough identity shifts are really important. From they do that to I do that. And it happens in lots of different spheres of our programs. And I think it's important. OK. So a second one that I want to talk about, that I also talk about, I'm going to focus on this second one. And there are others that we and you, you, know, you and I talk about. But th this one from purpose consumers to purpose creators. How many of you, show of hands, it's been seen by some 3 million people, and it's been referred to me a few times. There's a fellow by the name of Simon Sinek who has a YouTube video where he talks about, you know, the what of what our business does. Uh, he's got some concentric circles, and he talks about the, why, the, uh, the how and, and the why. How many of you have seen that video? Have you? Okay, maybe a third of us have seen that video. It's quite an interesting video. S-I-N-E-K, Simon Sinek. And, and the idea that he essentially says is, you know, everybody out there in the workplace knows about the what, right? We produce widgets, we do this service, this is what we do, this is what the company does. Everybody knows that. 
Um, a lot of people have a good sense for, for the how. We do it in a responsible way, with a footprint that looks like this, in a, in a super high touch way, whatever, whatever the, the how is. The why, though, right? Look, all of us have mission statements, every single one of us, right? We all know, also, that when you're trying to be meaning-making and it doesn't work, that's risky. So what I'm talking about here, we all know isn't easy. But we all also know when it's done well, it's profoundly animating for people, profoundly motivating. So part of what this, in this video he talks about is that the great companies start at the center. It's three concentric circles with why in the center and then how and then what is the outer circle. And, and he says they start from the why. That rather than saying, look, we, we produce computers. We produce computers that are user friendly and nicely styled. Do you want to buy one? That's sort of starting with what and working inward. Uh, his point is that companies like Apple, and he uses this example, they, they start with, look, everything we do, everything we believe starts with this idea of challenging the status quo, starts with this idea of thinking different. We've all seen the, the ads. And when we do that well, we produce produce computers, phones, other things that, that are easy to use and well-designed and so forth, and would you like to buy one? And, and he goes through this video and talks about why, you know, people, people actually want to consume the why. That's part of why you buy it, because you're buying that, that why. That's part of why Think Different was so potent. Now, all of this you've heard, this, none of this is new. But what, I'm, what I want to talk about today is, do our programs equip students for delivering the why? Do our programs really equip them for instilling in the people who work around them a greater sense of purpose? And we all know this is hard. But I'd like to think to a person in this room that leaders and managers who do this well create a lot of value. So I'm going to take that as a given, and we may agree to disagree on that premise. But the idea is it's hard to find great leaders who do not connect their people to why in an interesting, purposeful, meaning-making way. So, if we start with that, and then we start asking ourselves, how do we deliver that in our programs? Most, everybody wants to be part of an important why. That's, that's a, a very deep human need. How many of our graduates are going to be good at creating, or if you prefer, producing, generating? Why? So this, this is hard. It's both very important, vitally important, I think. When you think about the millennial generation, I was talking to somebody who's our, my, my vintage, roughly our vintage, I think, for, for the audience here. Just yesterday, he's one of my board members. And he said, you know, people, as they go through life, they become less and less compromising about the why. And he was making the point that, you know, at some point, it's sort of like, I've only got so much time left and why starts to set in. And we also made the obvious point that millennials and other generations sort of started with a little bit more why in their mix. And they probably also will lean into why even more over their, their profiles. But this is both, you know, even boomers uh, seem to, to connect to that more over time. So that's mostly what I want to talk about. Um, but I want to talk less about the articulation or the creativity in the why. I mean, I can't stand up here and say, not that Steve Jobs owned that articulation of what Apple was about, but he, he was closely associated with it. I guess part of what I want to talk about is, how do we operationalize why? 
Because if I stood up here and said, all of your students have the capability and all of us in the room have the capability to creatively articulate why, the way a Steve Jobs did, for example. Ah, I think you'd say, Rich, come on. I, I don't buy that. It's kind of like the old debate, all of us have been hit with this in the room. Are leaders born or made? Are entrepreneurs born or made? And one of the things that, when I hear those kinds of questions, that, that debate will never die, of course. It's a very real debate. But it's not like we are choosing an individual out of a distribution of the world's individuals and asking, could this individual become a leader or, or, or a, an entrepreneur? That's actually not the distribution we're sampling from. The students that are in our programs are extraordinary by many measures, right? So at the very least, the question is, are the students we see do they have the capability to become leaders, or at least better leaders, or entrepreneurs, et cetera, right? So, so that's, that's an important piece of that question. But the operationalizing of why is something all of us can do. There is a toolkit. How do we think about doing that? I'm going to read you another. So let, let me take a step back. First of all, why do I start by articulating these transformations in the first 10 minutes of when students come? Because they are not thinking that way when they arrive, right? They know they need to know the finance and the accounting and the strategy, and they're going to get a lot of that, right? But having them be open to those transformations when they start and accumulate experience and development through them is an important part of the program. And then, as I said, we loop back at the end. So when I think about for example, maybe the best piece of advice I've ever been given as dean. Top five. Who knows if it's the best? But it's one that I remember. It was the first board meeting when I was dean. I'm sure you all, many of you are deans in the room. You all remember your first board meeting as dean, right? And these boards are people who've been around the block a few times, right? There's no question about it. And a woman by the name of Margo Alexander said to me, in effect, don't forget, you are the chief purpose officer. It's part of your job. We're an educational institution. You might think that being part of this wonderful institution of higher ed that everybody who works here is going to get it every day. She said, you, you see it every day. You get to see the students. You see the classrooms. You see the ideas. You're talking to the recruiters. You, you, you see the faculty research. But 30, 40, 50, whatever percent of the people who work here, you know, might be spending 90% of their day processing travel reimbursements. They don't see it every day. You got to make sure you keep the, okay, right? So, but this idea of chief purpose officers, are we producing chief purpose officers? Can we produce chief purpose officers? Perfectly reasonable debate. Where I started, though, is where, where I feel firmly that if we can do this, we should work very, very hard at doing this. I believe that we can, but I think this is really fundamental. If you want, obviously, to attract great talent, to inspire and move people. When I talk to the students, particularly the undergrads, we have an undergraduate program, as many of you do as well. One of the first things I say to them is, you got here because you are an outstanding individual contributor and you have distinguished yourself as an individual contributor and you will get your life's best work done by working through and with other people. That's a different psychology. You can call that leadership, you can call it whatever you want, but that's where the big ripple effects of you are going to happen. And so helping them think a little bit about what what would I look like as a chief purpose officer? Look, I became dean roughly 10 years ago. Somebody said to me, you are the chief purpose officer. I'm a, an economist by training, financial economist. Look, I'm already in the dean's seat, and somebody says, you are the chief purpose officer? Never really thought about it. Not really. So we're thrust into positions of leadership all the time when the idea that part of our job description is being a chief purpose officer is not obvious to us. It certainly wasn't obvious to me. 
And I'm not going to stand up here and say I've done an excellent job at that. But my eyes are much more widely open in this dimension than they were before. So how do we, again, I'm not going to stand up here and say all of our students have the creative spark to articulate that mission or purpose in a way that galvanizes everyone. That, that's a harder statement. But how do we operationalize that? When I I'll give you a small example. When I received that lovely email, right, I couldn't, because people would know who it was and the program that we were launching, I couldn't send that email to our whole community. But I could send that email to a number of people and let them know that they shouldn't forward it. But this is part of what we're doing together. Now, each of us can either send those emails or not send those emails. But you talk about a communications opportunity, that's a really nice story. I'm going to read to you one other. So one of the things that I started doing, I'm not, again, I'm not standing up here and saying I get this exactly right. I don't. But after I got that wonderful advice as a new dean, you are the chief purpose officer. Now, I heard that as, here's some behavior you should be engaging in as our dean. Uh, which I think is part of how it was intended. But you can't help but also think that, look, ultimately we are responsible for our curricula, right? We're responsible for what our students get. We're responsible for whether our students are better at this or less, less good at this in their professional lives. And that's an even bigger task. So one of the things that I started doing, and I do it as best I can, I certainly don't do it perfectly, but I send I don't label them this way, but I send purpose emails to all of our staff and faculty from time to time, maybe every couple of months or something. I don't want to overdo it. But when I get an email or a story or something that just nails it, I take the time to communicate it to our whole community. And again, that's the advice that I got from Margot Alexander when she said, you're the chief purpose officer. So here's one of the things that I sent to everybody. I just forwarded this to our whole community. I took the name of the alum out of it. But you know, you, you heard something about, I'm not going to talk in detail about these principles that the Haas School wrote down, but I'll, I'll give a few examples. And um, this, this was an email that came in from an alum. We, we launched this effort to sort of write down a set of shared values. If somebody said, can you, are you telling me, Rich, that I can write down so galvanizing a mission statement? I can choose those 20 words rather than these 20 words, and everything's going to be golden. That's not at all what I'm saying. That's really hard. <laughs> Every single one of us has written down a mission statement. Um, it's really hard to write something like that down. But, if I widen the terrain and I say, how about shared values? Could you write down an articulation of values that your community shares that has some signature to it, that is a little different than what others might write down, that your people have, have pride in, that, that resonate because they're real, because they're true? And so that's what one of the things we tried to do. I don't think you could read our mission statement at Berkeley and say, now that is fantastic. And if somebody said the only way you can be a chief purpose officer, the only way you can affect this transition is by writing a better mission statement, I'd be wasting your time up here. But I think it's much wider than that, the opportunity. So we wrote down a set of values that we use for admissions like crazy. We have, you have to be able to, I'll give more examples about this, but as you operationalize this stuff, Everybody can see if you are not walking the walk. So let me give you a concrete example before I read this, this email that I sent to everybody. Uh, one of the things that we wrote down that we got from a recruiter, a recruiter said, I come here, I hire here at Berkeley Haas because your students have confidence without attitude. And we're part of a public university. We don't get this exactly right, but we take it super seriously. So then we said, well, what if we were to double down on that? What if we were to literally drive that through every part of our admissions process? And also the way we hire staff and also the way we, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so we did write that down. And we use it for our interviews, we use it for our essays, we use it for the letters of recommendation, blah, 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 right? But that's just operationalization. And 
But think about it this way. We have a small full-time MBA program. Just like you, we interview everybody who goes into our full-time MBA program. We don't currently interview everybody in our undergrad program, but we're, we're moving in that direction. If we interview somebody, look, the world needs all kinds. We just, we just wanted to take a stand on what we felt was important. Some people that most of us would describe as arrogant have been profoundly important for society and in history, right? There's no denying that. But that's not what we wanted to stand for. So imagine in this class, our class is only 250. Imagine incoming class of 250, and there are three, four, or five people in that class that are a very clear patent violation of confidence without attitude. The students would look at me and say, will you please stop talking? You are not walking the walk. Nobody could have interviewed that person and said, lines up perfectly with our values. So part of this, the operationalization we know is hard. Oh, but this person has a 790 GMAT. Are you just talking or is this real? So that's part of the hard part of operationalization. Here's the email. Among the many, again, I, about every two months I try to send what I hope is a helpful purpose email to our community. This one came about two years after we launched this, this culture, this, these defining principles, shared values effort. It's, it's brief, I'll just read it directly. So the, the subject line, Haas, we call them defining principles. Haas defining principles in raising our son. Dean Lyons, I'm an MBA alum from 2011, and our family recently welcomed our first child, Nikhil, into the world. A question I have been asking many of my friends and family. If there are three behaviors, values, ideas, you can guarantee Nikhil will believe by his 18th birthday, what would they be? I've gotten several very interesting answers and my summary of them became one, a focus on education, two, a perspective greater than oneself, and three, resilience through tough times. Then I thought about it some more and realized these represent our school's core defining principles. One, students always. Two, beyond yourself. And three, confidence without attitude. Final paragraph, the Haas culture transcends generations. Signed off, AJ. Now, so you read that and you think, look, he's not kidding. And neither are we. And that's, one of the things, so I'm, not a, I'm not here to, to congratulate ourselves, myself. Uh, this is, as soon as I saw this, after having been given that advice by this board member, you are the chief purpose officer, right? The notion is, how do I connect our community to this message, right? And that's one of the things, as we think about getting better at this, that I think you would do, and it's certainly something that I've tried to do. Now, let me, I want to leave some time for Q&A. I think we have until nine. So I'm going to take uh, five or 10 more minutes to talk a little bit about operationalizing some of this stuff. Not that we got it exactly right. Some of the things we did not get right. Um, and then leave it open for Q&A, because I'm sure you have questions on this, right? But the student experience, let me just underscore this before I give some operationalization suggestions, or at least describe some of the things we did. The, the student's experience, when you tell a student on day one, part of what people are going to expect from you. I was told this at however old I was, 45. If they're told at 28, you're going to need to become a chief purpose officer. That can change the way they code their experience. Right? There's this idea of meaning makers as being an important part of leadership and management. It's not a necessary condition. There are a lot of great leaders and managers who aren't good at this, right? But I think we all realize if we can equip our students with this, it matters. So let me talk a little bit about operationalization now. And I want to talk about confidence. The confidence without attitude element of this is when when we think, I'll just cut, carve, there, there were four of them, they were read before, I won't walk through all of them. I just want to talk about two of them 
in a more operational way. One is confidence without attitude, and the other is beyond yourself, beyond yourself being a sense of stewardship for something beyond just you and your career. Um, so confidence without attitude, one of the things that we did, which is similar to what you all do when you think about this, right, is could, could we, first of all, can we write something down? Now, this is, at the end of the day, you know, institutions thrive. They are fit in an evolutionary sense. When they are different in a valuable way, right? We, we don't succeed by being the same. We, we succeed by being different. In a, in a useful and valuable way. And so the word humility, somebody said, well, that sounds like humility. And it overlaps a lot with humility. But we also felt like humility, we're a business school for crying out loud, right? Humility isn't going to work for us as a word. It's a great word. And some, some of you may use it. And it's a word that often gets used. But we felt like putting confidence out in front of that was, was a really important part of what we did. So just taking that one principle, if you said, well, how does that change what you actually do? So I mentioned admissions. It's one very, very important process, but it's not the only process. As you know very well, many of you much better than I do, admissions isn't one process. It's 15 different processes, right? It's what do the interviews look like? What does the interview assessment form look like? How are people trained to do interviews? What about the essays? What about the letters of recommendation? All of that stuff, right? So one of the things that we did is we said, what if, for example, we asked those letter of recommendation writers a question like, uh, in the leaders we develop at Berkeley Haas, we value very highly confidence without attitude. Does this person have that? Give us concrete examples. Now, how long did it take to change that list of questions on our application? Well, five minutes, right? That's an easy change. What are the implications of that change? Well, like you, we get thousands and thousands and thousands of letters of recommendation every year, and you've all written them and received them, right? And you know the process, right? I've got 45 minutes to write a letter for these three schools, for this person, I better get cracking, and then you look at those. So that question about confidence without attitude is not something that streams across a screen. Some 10,000 people actually have to write about it, and then they have to go on to another school and address the questions that that other school asked. And they notice, viral message to 10,000 plus people, huh, I didn't see a question like that on any of the others. Right. Very small process change, one little piece, literally, like 1 15th of our admissions process. And what did it do? It sends a, a viral message to thousands and thousands of people. And it also, the second piece, is it sends signal back to us for helping to select, right? So we, Naturally, there's going to be self-selection from those who are considering our school, and then there's going to be selection on our side to try and get this to work well. And look, I won't go into a lot more detail, but if somebody said, Rich, count the business processes on the faculty side, the curriculum side, the staff side, the student side, ori the orientation, admissions, all of it, how many processes got changed? Or to put it differently, when the next dean comes in, how many processes will she have to change when she wants to go a different direction? Hundreds, hundreds. It will be very hard to reverse a lot of this stuff. So part of it in creating something durable is to make those process changes. And I won't walk you through all of them, but I just gave you one example of a process change that our chief operating officer and, and many others on the team, they actually did, they, they sort of did a complete inventory of the number of business processes we run in all the parts of our, our business, what we do, and they figured out how many they could encode something like that in. All right, beyond yourself, a couple of quick thoughts on this. One of the things, if you say, what, what didn't go so well? Well, one of the things that didn't go as well, one of the things I would do differently after the fact, is when you write down something like beyond yourself or confidence without attitude, I think our students who tend to live in a little bit more of a world of abstraction, they can see those big shiny objects and say, I like that, I get it. For our staff, they wanted it to be more concrete. It's like, what does this mean tomorrow? How is this gonna change the performance evaluation? What, what does this look like? Give me examples. We weren't quick enough to map these principles into tangible behaviors, 
right? The first thing an HR expert would tell you is map them into behavior so people know what you're talking about, right? And we were slow to do that. And that being slow did not hurt as much on the alumni and the student front, but it, but it hurt on the staff front because it was like, it still feels like you're talking about this stuff and we want to we wanna know what it means directly. So one of the things for us as a frontier, and I'm sure for many of you as well, is how do we drive behaviors? How do we sort of represent? You don't want to say beyond yourself is these three behaviors, right? That, that, would, that would diminish it. But people do say, give me some examples. So I was at my table earlier this morning. We were talking about like collaboration and, as, and the world of work, the world is becoming more collaborative, right? This idea that it is a accumulation of what individual contributors are doing in the world, and that's, that's what the world's evolution looks like. Not at all, right? It's more and more and more about pe people working with and through other people. And so collaboration matters. Let me give you one example. Beyond yourself, I guarantee, I, well, I shouldn't guarantee it. I, I did not think about this at all this way. But if you tell somebody, I've talked to companies, companies will tell me that when either they or their competitors are good at one behavior, among others, but this one behavior is singled out a lot, and it is the sharing of information. A lot of, not just in professional service firms, across lots of industries. If you ask a CEO, I've got two companies, they are identical, except for one behavioral norm. In company A, people share information with their peers that they think is useful for the business. And in company B, which is the norm, people hoard information. I want to be indispensable. I'm not going to share information. So people will hoard information by nature. But if you can have a, a company culture, an institutional culture, where people share information, you know, the enterprise value of that, of that first company, the sharing company, could be 10% higher than the second one based on that single behavioral norm. That's not a crazy idea. I hope you don't feel that's a crazy idea. So one of the things we tell our students is, you know what beyond yourself looks like in the world of behaviors? It's about sharing information. And then we tell stories, similar to what you do, I'm sure. On day one, we will say, look, we have students that work very, very hard doing the reading for that core course. And they put the notes together and they synthesize them. And then they hit send and they send their notes to their fellow students. But only X percent of them will get an A, somebody might respond. Not the problem they're trying to solve. So when you can put behaviors, and we're just starting to do this, underneath those principles, then that's really helpful for them. It's helpful for our staff, it's helpful for our students, and that's part of what we're trying to do. Now, let me, let me conclude and then we'll, we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, when we, uh, I think we're in the transformation business. We're not in, really, we're not in the delivery of functional skills business only. Delivering great finance, marketing, and strategy, those are necessities. Those are important. But that's the part that's getting disrupted the fastest, right? That's the stuff people can get in the MOOCs and other things, right? It's the transformations part of what we deliver. I think we need to be as explicit as we can about those things. And if we actually believe that great leaders and managers are great ch chief purpose officers, or often are, and we believe that that's a skill set, at the very least, the operationalization of, of, of purpose is a skill set we can deliver to our students, then that's, that's really the, the thesis of, of these remarks, is that we should do that. Because meaning making is getting more important for leaders and managers, not less important. And we can help deliver those skills. First though, in my judgment, we need to also set a good example of how we are doing this in our own organizations. I was already a dean before I'd started thinking about the idea that part of my job 
was instilling a larger sense of purpose in the people around me. What if I had understood that idea 20 years before and had begun processing the world through that lens and had learned a thing or two about what's easy and what's hard? We know this is hard. Some of you may have read Lucy Kellaway. I'll, I'll conclude on this because what I'm talking about is both important and hard. Lucy Kellaway, who writes for the Financial Times, had an article in the last year called um, essentially raise your hand if, if, you, if you know your values. And what she did is she said, we brought senior people, we had a conference going on at the FT, we brought senior people together, and I played a little trick on them, she says. I looked on the websites of all the companies that were going to be represented, and I wrote down the core values that they have on their websites. And then when we got everybody in the room, at the beginning of the conference, I asked everybody, how many of you know the core values of your company? And all the hands went up. And then I said, I'm going to read your core values company by company, set by set. And when your company's set gets read, please raise your hand. <laughs> that was harder, uh, in part because the overlap was so high, right? Um, so for me to stand up here and say this stuff is easy is absolutely wrong. And part of her argument was not that you shouldn't be doing this, but that it's easy to not do it well, so go in with eyes open. And that's part of what I'm hoping we will do, is encourage our students to go into this with eyes open, to help our faculty understand that part of our job as an institution is to build stronger chief purpose officers. Now, I'm an economist. If I stand up in front of my finance and economics colleagues and I say that the way I just said it, you know what kind of blowback I'm going to get from some of them. But if you can start to show it, last comment. I'm not going to read the whole email. But here's an email that I sent to the tenure track faculty at Berkeley. You might say, well, how with that audience? What the heck? How do you get? I mean, our management group gets this. That's what they teach. But you leave our management group or your management group, and it gets hard. Here's an email I sent, May 16, 2016. Title, subject line, culture slash defining principles hyphen benefits. Colleagues, I'm sometimes asked to describe some of the tangible benefits that have come from driving our culture and defining principles through so much of what we do, e.g. admissions, exec ed, fundraising, etc. Here's an overview of how I typically answer. Talks about admissions. Here, here's one. In admissions, there is arguably no better measure of benefit than winning the people we admit based on a significant, based in significant part on culture defining principles. The attached page presents data. Data. Our faculty want to see data. It presents data from the admits to our full-time MBA program, those who ultimately chose us and those who did not, regarding factors that influenced their decision. Across the two groups together, our culture defining principles was the single most positive factor driving them toward Haas, more important even than our location in the Silicon Valley Bay Area or our reputation. Next category, exec ed. I recently received a list from our Center for Executive Education team that had over 10 companies who made their final decision to choose us over the competition due in part to, and in some cases due mostly to, our culture and defining principles. I'm not aware of any company that chose not to go with us due to our culture and we generally do get feedback even when not selected. And then it talks about fundraising and it talks about a number of things here. Look, I'm not gonna go through the details, but if, if you think about this chief purpose officer orientation as a change management program, how do we actually do this in a systemic way? Then you have to change a lot of attitudes because this is not the natural orientation of our faculty and it's not the natural orientation of a lot of people. If you put a benefits lens on it, if they can see both how I fit in and what's in it for me, then even the most skeptical faculty can start to say, this ain't my cup of tea, but I'm starting to like what's happening. And that's not a bad place to be.